Country Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. And then they had me playing this thing where I was triggering a, a pad. You know, I was triggering and then I was separate, playing the snare separate and the toms overdubbed and so everything is separated like they oh, used yeah. to do in the 80s, you know. Uh-huh. And I'm just like, let me just play. Let me just set up my kit and play. I says, I want the drums to sound like Creedence Clearwater, you know? Yeah. And the engineer's like, Creedence, that's horrible. Are you kidding me? Listen to Suzy Q. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? That's the way drums are supposed to sound. Man. Who was the engineer? I'm not going to say. Did. Uh, anybody <laughs> out? Welcome to Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge. With your host, Aaron the A Train Smith. Everybody to Intersect Radio today. It's Tuesday. And once again, here we are down in the dungeon, the catacombs, doing a, doing a radio show. Oh, I got a special guest today. Very special guest. Good friend. Drummer, songwriter, percussionist, producer. He's a real deal, folks. He's best known as the co-founding member of the alternative rock band, The Choir, and he serves as the group's drummer, lyricist, and co-producer. They debuted in 1985, and since that time, they've been nominated for a Grammy in 2001 and recently released their 17th studio, studio album, Bloodshot, in 2018. He's a member of the Alternative Americana group as well, The Lost Dogs. Uh, he's a prolific songwriter. He has written and co-written hundreds of re- recorded songs. He has produced numerous artists, including Sixpence, None the Richer, The Prayer Chain, Solveig, Lake Cog. <laughs> Pretty good. Did I say that right? And Solve Sarah Lighthouse. Gross. Yeah. Huh? Solveig Lighthouse. Oh. Like Lighthouse. Lighthouse. Yeah. Light, lighthouse. Boy. Norwegian artist. <laughs> yeah, Norwe- Norwegian. And most recently, he's got a solo al- al- album done for Derry Doherty, who was just on the program last Tuesday. You know, he's um, his, maybe one of your largest, one of your biggest accomplishments is the project um, City on a Hill. Yeah. And um, he co-wrote the song... Lord God of Wonders, along with Mark Bird. The third day do that? Yeah, third day did it. Did do it. How yeah. many artists have done that song? Uh, I don't know. I'll be hundreds, you know. <laughs> Man, that's great to write a song that a lot that of people do. That like that. It's, yeah. it's, uh, I'm glad it's that song and not like some, you know, uh, Nissan uh, car commercial or something. <laughs> All the things you, we've tried, you know. Uh, I'm really happy that that, it's, that, that was a song. That's the that one, caught the yeah. Wind. yeah. That's great. So my guest, you probably already know now, it's Mr. Steve Hendelong. Yay. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. Hey, thanks for saying yes. We talked about this some time ago. Yeah, I was a little apprehensive. As, yeah, as I know. I'm like, you're not going to... You know, <laughs> I had to tell him he wasn't coming on the Bible Answer Man show. Yeah, well, we we were in a hotel room, you know, uh, last year, and we got a big argument. Sort of, I don't. Would you call it an argument or just like a no, I enthusiastic call it an discussion? Argument. You know, 
But, we, you know, it got all theological, and I'm like, I don't know if I would have talked to Aaron on, on the air. I don't know. <laughs> Some things are best, you know, because I'm not the kind that, you know what I mean? I, I don't get on Facebook and get in, in any of the threads. I don't talk about politics or, or theology or anything, I, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I love to argue about that stuff in, in, with my friends and people I respect, but I don't, yeah. I, I'm a little reluctant in public with the, yeah. uh, the controversy. I'd rather just... You know, I get to write songs, so I get to make things rhyme and put them in some veiled poetic way. <laughs> yeah, and that's you how know? you and that's how you get that release, right? Mm-hmm. Right, man. Well, we were having a pretty good time, as I recall, that night. Yeah, it was a pretty good time. Yeah, yeah. we it always was very had a, late. <laughs> you know, some of the best times we ever have is in those festivals when we end up in the hotel rooms after. Mm-hmm. Because usually it's our own insulated world, touring bands, you know, it's me and Derry always in the room or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when it gets all mixed up, all the bands, and, and we get to stay up all night carrying on, that's pretty darn fun, right? Yeah, it is. I hadn't <laughs> done that in a long time. Yeah. I hadn't done that since Cornerstone. Well, no, mm-hmm. since since uh, Rich Mullins' days, where we used to do a show and then go back to the hotel and everybody would converge on the swimming pool uh-huh, and yeah. just stay up. Knowing that we had to check out at six, six o'clock in the morning to get to the next gig on time, and, and it's like we are at the pool and it's four a.m. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. So thank you for being here. Yeah, you know what? What have you been up to? Well, the the choir's been doing a lot of stuff. You mm-hmm. know, we got Darius' uh, solo record done and. It's pretty wonderful. I, I can't wait for people to it took people waited forever for it. You know. But um, because Derry, you know, he was taking care of his dad and yeah. different things. But um, it's it's beautiful. It's way worth the wait. I'm I'm telling people, but I think it comes out in a few weeks. But we went ahead and got the choir record done, Bloodshot, and um, just last week we dropped it on you know to the pledge people, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I think by the end of the month it gets shipped all the part, all the t-shirts and the products, all the stuff. I don't know. Dan Michaels does all that stuff I, for us, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't, I barely know what's going on, but. And then we have a Kickstarter launching tonight uh, related to our uh, a reissue of our kick of our um, kick, Kissers and Killers record mm-hmm. from '93. So I don't know if I should give it away, but, uh, but yeah, I mean we we we're doing uh, we did vin- we're doing vinyl for it, and then we also recorded the record acoustically, uh, okay. or Derry and I did, and and. Uh, which is not just that stripped down. It's pretty. It's pretty uh, well realized. It's uh, we love to do that kind of a stripped down acoustic thing, and, mm-hmm. and um, so it's pretty cool to reinterpret those songs because that was our noisiest, most grungy record. Uh, a lot of people, it's their favorite for that reason. A lot of people, it's their least favorite for that reason. <laughs> but to reinterpret those songs in a different way, it really is is interesting. So, did you do um, um, acoustic guitar and percussion? Yeah, you know, what else? glockenspiel, wine glasses, uh, yeah. suitcases, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, cello, piano, uh, you know, a little stand-up bass. You know, it's pretty ri- It's pretty full. Sounding. Where'd you do it? Stephen Lywicky, uh, which is right right down the street right from down me, the street. right here in East Nashville. And yeah. he's, he's been producing, he produced our record. We've all, usually self-produced ourselves uh, most all the time, but... Um, Right about now, it just felt really good to have um, uh, a producer, mm-hmm. have somebody. In, and uh, I I do a lot of records with Steven, so we have a really good rapport. And so, yeah, he produced um, Bloodshot and this acoustic thing. Oh, he did? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's fantastic. Oh, wow. I love working with Steven. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, LiveWiki is good, man. Yeah. Oh, he's fast. He's really and, fast. And very knowledgeable uh, about his gear. All that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, and a great guitar player, and just he plays yeah. everything. He plays everything, keys, and I mean, he played bass on Derry's record. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's wow. like, oh yeah, I play bass too. You know, we played uh, Unhypnotized last week. Yeah, isn't that a great song? Yeah, it is. It's, man, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I love that song. Stephen Mason playing that Wicked Lap Steel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, we've been having those Jars guys come around lately. Uh, Steve and Charlie, they're fantastic. I mean, just, mm-hmm. just, it's, it's really fun having them in together um, because they have that, that rapport like guys that have been in a band forever have right. with each other, you know, and uh, so that's been fun. Mm-hmm. This is Jars of Clay, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those guys. Yeah. It's cool. So um, 
man, I don't, I don't know um, too much about you prior to like 1985. Mm-hmm. So let's let's go way back. And uh, right. are you a Californian? Yes, I'm Californian. I I was um, in elementary school years. I was in the Valley, uh, Reseda, then Encino, California, and then. Um, yeah, I uh, we moved to Montebello in seventy one when I was eleven. That's pretty much East LA. Mm-hmm. I miss all of my friends were, were Mexicans, pretty much. Okay, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, I worked in a hardware store for a long time in, in a in a Spanish speaking area. You know, so ask oh. me anything, any anything in a hardware store in Spanish. Okay, uh, you know, las bisagras, hinges, el tornillo. You know. Um, Clavo snails, you know, Las Arrucha, anything in Spanish uh, I know in a hardware store. And also we were a feed store, so we, we, we sold animals. So I also know, you know, comida, which is food. Comida para los, you know, pollitos, uh, palomas. And you, you just know. learned it just by being in the store? Just to talk to the customers. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to the I customers. worked there for eight years, so. Wow. Um, it's killer. But yeah, I, I, in my first band uh, was called uh, Touch of Soul. You know, and I was like, I was all Mexican stuff for me. And it was like we did Earth, Wind, and Fire songs, a shining stuff for you to see, and all okay. that stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lido Shuffle and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Boss Gags. Boss and, Gags. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this 76, you know, Touch of Soul. Yeah. You guys play clubs or what? No, I didn't. I didn't we didn't play. Mostly we just played in the garage with the door open, you know, hoping people come around. But Oh, really? I remember we, we did a junior high dance. Um, and we all, each guy got 20 bucks, you know, and I was like, I'm a professional musician now, you know, it was so exciting, you know, got to pay taxes now, yeah. 16 and you get 20 bucks for playing, God, you know, <laughs> you know, I had a pickup truck. Um, and I never had cases for my drums, you know, I would just put them in the back of the truck open, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I had, I always had a pickup truck, you know, and I had a Datsun. Uh, and then I had a Chevy Love, and then I had the Ford Courier. Yeah. Know. Drummer's got to have a truck. You Drummer's got to have some way to get that gear around. <laughs> yeah. And plus, you know, it's good to have a truck if you got to move anything like that, you know? It's good, yeah. Yeah, it's good to have a truck. Yeah. My dad's a kind of guy that had a truck. Um, for He didn't even need one, but he said people need to borrow it. I mean, he's that kind of guy. My dad's this, this super generous mm. uh, servant type guy. and. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he he kept a truck around just just in case people needed to borrow it. Mm-hmm. Is your dad <laughs> still with us? Yeah, my dad. Um, uh, he's uh, eighty one, eighty, eighty, eighty one. I think. Uh, but um, yeah, eighty. I'm sorry, dad. Uh, they were uh, missionaries to Moscow, Russia, in their sixties. Oh, really? Yeah, and then they came here. I've been in Nashville twenty five years, but um, my dad. I think they came out like ten years ago or something, and um. I see them uh, fairly often, and um, cool. There, there's nobody more supportive of of me and my music than than my my parents, especially my dad. I mean, he would come to oh, gigs and he would come to clubs at one in the morning in Hollywood, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though he would never, it's a bar, you know what I mean. But he would not the kind of guy that would ever drink or anything like that. But he would come to the bar, and if I was playing, he'd be there. He'd be there, man. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, he, my dad was a drummer. Um, at Venice High School, and uh, and uh, he's the one that taught me. You know, when I was nine, he taught me a cadence, his high school cadence, okay, uh, which I can still play. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and that was like 1969. I was nine, and uh, uh, he had a snare drum, and uh, they have a marching snare drum. It's a big um, no, I had a Slingerland kit, you know. Um, oh, okay. Um, but he got rid of that. I, I'm trying to remember. It's all fuzzy. Um, but he got me a snare drum for my uh, birthday for in third grade. I was nine. And uh, I didn't get a kit. I mean, because we, we were pretty low. You know, we didn't have any money, you know, very little money. And so um, every year, a birthday, he would add another thing. Like, I remember in sixth grade, I got a kick drum. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I got a tom the next year, and then I got a hi hat in eighth grade, and floor tom. I got all these pieces, and they're really bad, terrible, you know, just Japanese drums, you know. And I always dreamed of having a, a great kit 
you know, and I never did until I graduated from high school. And then I got the, the mid sixties, uh, Ludwig black diamond. Oh yeah. Yeah. For graduation. Okay. And it got stolen out of my truck a year oh, later. Oh, dude. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> my my first real drum kit was a Ludwig. It was Silver Sparkle. Nice. Uh, my mom put me on a bus, and I went up to New York. New York City. And a friend of, our, of the family met me in, in uh, Grand Central Station, took me around the corner to Manny's Music. You know, it was a little, bit of, little bitty hole in the wall then. It's huge now. And uh, the lady behind the counter said, uh, how can I help you today, young man? And I said, I want a drum set. Whoa. She said, well, how much of a drum set do you want? And I had a money order. I gave her the money order. She said, hmm, okay. Took me in the back. All the drums were on the top shelf. She said, well, there they are up there. You, you got enough money to have either one of those, you know. So I took the silver one. Nice. Now, what year was this? This is 1967. All right. Okay. I took it to college, got stolen. No. See what I mean? Oh, that hurts. That's Man, the whole makes... thing, cases, symbols. Out of your vehicle? Everything. Or, uh, where, where you know, get... at school, they were, you know, we started a band at school and we got permission to use a closet to put the amps and their drums in. Yeah. You know? And uh, somebody broke in the room, and that's the only thing they stole oh, was the whole drum set. That hurts. Left real bad. the left the PA and all that stuff. Yeah, I was. Well, thing about sad. drums, like uh, you know, we, we have to. It's all setting up and tearing down. That's what it is. Yeah, you know, that's what that's what drums is mostly. It's setting up and tearing down, carrying them up the stairs, down the stairs, and you get home at one in the morning, and you. You know, you got to drag those drums out of your truck and put them in the garage or whatever. You got to take them inside, right? That's right. And once in a while, you get lazy. You're like, oh, I'll just leave them in there mm-hmm. over the night. You know, you're so tired. And that's what I, that's when mine got stolen. It's like really? so never again. I just like haul them up the. I'm still hauling them up the stairs yeah. down the stairs. You yeah. Know? And um, that's one thing I decided a long time ago that I wasn't gonna gonna feel. Uh, I wasn't gonna be bummed out about dragging drums around. I'm gonna think I'm I'm a drummer. It's part of the deal. Hey, mm-hmm. some people go to the Y and work out, you know, lift weights. I'm carrying them up the stairs. I'll just give them another couple of pumps. You know, I think of it as my workout. You yeah. Know? <laughs> my little skinny legs need the workout, you know. <laughs> so I embrace it because the minute you start going, oh, no, you start, if you're, you know, feeling the pain, yeah. it, it'll be a tough gig. It's yeah. a tough life, you know, because <laughs> no one's going to help you. The guitar player's not going to help you. Mike no. Rowe's not going to carry your anything for you. Oh, no. You know. <laughs> No, he's not. <laughs> you know, it's part we of. We love that. you, though, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll be. I'll put back my drums and then go pick up his guitar for him. That's mm-hmm. what it is. But anyway. So, how is it that your your parents became missionaries? Well, they were. Um, I'm not exactly sure because I was gone. You know, I, I mean, mm-hmm. they, I was in Nashville, and and uh, they. Were, so they, they 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 showed no. Well, they were they were all about this. they were they had. They were Christian school principals, and they were all about the ministry okay. and, and all that. All, their, my whole life, my, my parents were all about um, the ministry. I mean, the Lord does everything, you know. Okay. Um, and so um, I, somehow they, they took a couple of trips to, to, to Russia and fell in love with the people, and, and then they ended up just selling everything they had uh, in their 60s. Sold their house, sold, got rid of everything. Wow. They just went for it. They just went to Moscow, and they pretty much were there for— 10 years, you know, coming back and forth. Uh, huh. but they just assimilated themselves into the culture and, and, uh, they still have, um, well, you know, for a few years, they, they're not because of health issues and so forth. They can't do it anymore, but they still are like, well, one, they have one, one guy that, uh, actually changed his name to, uh, Artur Hindelong. <laughs> he actually changed his name to their name because they're like his parents to, to him. Really? Yeah, and they have are, are there's they have people that are like they're like family mm-hmm. to these people, um, and that's now, what they do here. They, they, here in all they 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 have Sudanese family they take care of here, and they just they're just servants, you know. They just love people. All right, so they're My back in the do. states now. Yeah, they they live here in Antioch, Tennessee. They've been here for a few oh, years, but um, that's cool. They're very happy people. The happiest uh, married couple I've ever known. Mm-hmm. 
after they're coming up on 60 years. And Excellent, so, man. That's great. Yeah. So tell me, um, Derry had his version of the story. How I'd like to hear yours. How did you guys meet? Well, I heard Derry's interview and he, he told it pretty accurately. Um, I was going to school at a zoo specific college and playing in all the school groups, you know, jazz band and all that. And with Tim Chandler was there mm-hmm. playing bass. And, um, he was connected with Derry in some way, both him and Derry's dads were Pentecostal pastors and they had some, some kind of a connect. Uh, so Tim just came to me and said, Hey, I know this guy, um, that we should get together. He writes songs. And Tim knew I kind of was a songwriter and he says, I think we should get together with this guy. Uh, uh, Derry and he knows the guys in Daniel Amos. Like really, he knows the guys in Daniel Amos. Yeah, you know. So there might be something could happen there. You know, if we yeah. get a cassette to one of the guys in Daniel Amos. You know. <laughs> so yeah, he got us together and we met. Um, yeah, we met up and started started. Um, you know, back then we're talking like seventy nine, eighty. You know, and our, it sounded almost like the Eagles. You know, there was no, really? pol- there, nobody, we hadn't really mm-hmm. heard the police or you, there was no U2 yet or anything like that. You know, mm-hmm. a new wave hadn't happened. We were, we were, you know, kind of, yeah, kind of like, I don't know, California country rock almost, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the first songs that we, we wrote together and played. I mean, Derry was song, writing the songs back then. Uh, but then Tim, as a result of Derry's relationship with Daniel Amos, got in Daniel Amos, I believe in 82. Cool. Uh, and then we we went and found another bass player, a guy named Mike Sarbre, and that's when we started the band Youth Choir. Mm-hmm. And that's when we got, you know, I remember Derry took me to see the police at the forum uh, around then. And I'm mm-hmm. like, whoa, 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 what is this? You know, <laughs> what is this? This is something pretty great, you know. Yeah. And um, so that's when we started our, got into the Youth Choir. And, um, and then eventually Tim came back, and of course he's, he was back and forth quite a bit. Uh, but um, mm-hmm. doing different things. Um, is he there now? Is what? he in the choir now? Tim? Yeah, yeah. He, he just played our last record. Okay. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, but we've had a variety of bass players mm. over the years, uh, you know. But yeah, that's how we got together. Um, yeah. That's great. Well, at least you guys are on the same page about that. He told me about the touring and stuff like that. We toured a lot, you know, we toured more than any of our, our peers, other mm-hmm. bands, you know, we got across the country. Uh, we were, we wore out five events, mostly Conline events, wow. dragging a trailer, pulling a trailer. You know how it is that the, the yeah. new joints go or there's a hole in the gas tank or there's a, the transmission goes or whatever. Eventually the engine goes, mm-hmm. um, eventually, you know, and most <laughs> of them were the church fans, Conline, because Derry's dad was so supportive, you know, and. I guess they thought we were a ministry. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh so loud at that, but, uh, you know, uh, so we got to use the church fans, you know, for free until we killed them. It'd be the phone, the phone call, you know, and then, you know, they'd be all bummed, but then they'd let us use another van. You know? uh-huh. But we put a lot of miles. We, we, we traveled the country a lot. And, um, I love it still, man. I cannot, I mean, I'm thrilled. And Derry too. We are so happy when we are driving across the country. Welcome to Iowa or whatever yeah. it is. You know what I mean? That's great. I love the whole country. Yeah. I cannot get enough of it. I love the people everywhere. You know, I don't know. I don't, it's hard to say what's my favorite. Cause yeah. I, but um, we're already, you know, we're going to be going out again this spring, this summer. And we're like, can't wait, can't yeah. wait to get on the road. I, I, I enjoy the photographs of, uh, those morning breakfasts. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> See what Ro does. Ro is like trying to show Derry's terrible eating, you know, which is pretty terrible. Okay. But what Ro's not showing is what's on his plate. <laughs> right. right. You know, what's on his plate is like all that sugary stuff, pancakes, pancakes with all yeah. these, you know, sweets and whipped cream. Uh-huh. And it's like death by grease or death by sugar, you know, <laughs> Pick your, it's, for me, it's appalling on on every level, on yeah. both sides. The entire table is appalling to me. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, it's so gross. Oh Look at stuff gosh. I'm going, first thing in the morning, no, Derry, it's really? True. No, it's, it's real. It's like, it's it's hard to believe, but it's true. Mm-hmm. And he's so tiny. Well. You know? That's pretty cool. But um, when did you start songwriting? You you said you you were... Songwriting, writing songs even back then. Huh? Oh, when you guys early, first met. yeah. 
Well, I wanted to be, um, I was like a po- poet guy, a little weird, freaky little uh, poet guy, you know, always. And even in, in high school, you know, even before that, I, I wanted to to write words, like words. Hmm. And um, I learned how to play the guitar in junior high. And um, I always was the guy that um, just learned enough chords to, to participate, but I played the drums. I was a drummer. But I wanted to write the words. I wanted to be a part of the songwriter process since I was in junior high. Hmm. And I always was in a band. Um, you know, my influences were the the folky, you know, I liked the James Taylor and the Joni Mitchell and um, all that stuff that, um, you know, I, I still, that, that kind of thing, those kind of people were so vulnerable and honest and exposed. And I kind of followed that pattern. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that, well, that's what the great songwriters do. They just tell the truth. They, they they risk it. They dare to be uh, transparent, mm-hmm. and that's kind of st- where I got that, you know. But um, yeah, I loved Neil Young and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, all through the the, the seventies. And um, I thought that the the end line on on the song we played today, um, the time has come mm-hmm. where you said to forgive your sorry self. Yeah, yes. Well, I wasn't re- I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, that's um. That's the season I'm in. Uh, I'm 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 trying to forgive myself. You know, I, I've had some. It's a difficult season I'm coming through. You know, so um, yeah. But I've I risk being uh, vulnerable and personal because I figure everybody's going through stuff, and it doesn't serve anybody to act like you're not uh, that I have have something figured out that they don't. Right. Um, so. Um, and our theme has always been mercy on you, mercy on me. I, I feel that um, that's the most important quality of anybody to be merciful, and certainly people of faith. Uh, that's the biggest trouble I have with, with the culture that we're in, the evangelical. Um, why I have a hard time uh, associ- being associated with that particular tribe mm-hmm. these days is mm-hmm. because um, it's so much just the opposite of mercy. Yeah. It seems like it's... it's uh, it's a real cruel face uh, shown, represented to the world a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, you know, there's nobody more merciful than Jesus. He lifted people up, lifted women up, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm veering off on t- some tangent, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> you you tried to it seems like you tried to get some chronology like we're gonna go all the way back and I'm just bouncing all over the place. That's know? all right. <laughs> bouncing is good, man. Yeah, bouncing is really good. I have a little attention. It's not attention deficit. It's attention management. My my therapist yeah. explained to me. Uh, yeah. Problem. Uh, but, so uh, was it a was it a hassle for you to move to Nashville? You had a family and everything. Well, it was a big move. I mean, yeah, I had two little girls. Uh, they were. Five and three, Emily and Aaron and, and uh, Nancy, and we all just got one of those yellow trucks, and we all were in the four, four in the front cab, drove two thousand miles, pulling a really crummy car uh, behind us that we should have left, you know. <laughs> but uh, we came all the way out, and uh, yeah, it was like a big risk. A lot of us did. A lot of Californians were, you know, were coming out here, of course, uh, trying to trying to find a. Uh, try to survive, you know, yeah. the economy got really difficult out there and yeah. we were just, just trying to survive. Yeah. That's so, why I moved here. You know, it was like, well, I need to take a chance. Yeah. Sometimes you have to take a risk. Yeah. The hardest part I think was the the weather. I mean, you know, the winter, I'd never been through winter. And, and we, when we came out, we, we had that ice storm that I think it was 94, mm-hmm. the worst ice storm ever and of course our pipes are busting and we can't drive on the snow i have a song on the new album called uh, californians on ice <laughs> it's just about all the catastrophes that happened to us you know because uh-huh. we don't know what to do about the snow you know and, yeah and um it's sort of a, a metaphor for just you know uh trying to adapt to new circumstances mm-hmm. and all the things that don't that don't go the way we think they're supposed to go yeah and um yeah because you you got to get a wardrobes for everybody brand new wardrobes you know yeah because those california clothes just don't work here in right the you just need one closet in california i mean yeah. you know it gets cold you put on your flannel shirt you know 
it's in the same closet where mm-hmm. the whole thing about, well, we need to get our winter clothes in a box and, you know, shift. So I love that. I'll t- I've come to love the seasons. Mm-hmm. I, I love it. And um, I don't like the winter too much, but I can take the heat, you know. Yeah. Uh, or it's coming. I know, I know. People are crying about it. I'm like, ah, oh, quit crying, you know. <laughs> Shut your crying. Yeah. Shut crying. Your but pile. I cry about the cold, though. I don't like it cold, you know. I don't, I, well, I, you know, I don't mind the cold because there are things you can do to stay warm. Well, right. If you know, if you go out in the heat, you know, even if you got on like a T-shirt and shorts and stuff, it's still going to be pretty hot, pretty darn hot. Right. And then there are other elements you have to deal with and. That come along with the heat, like mosquitoes. And Don't like the like mosquitoes. That. Do not like the mosquitoes, yeah. No. We were just, Steve and I were sitting here um, talking earlier um, and reminiscing when, when we moved here to Nashville, our youngest daughters, was that your youngest daughter? That was my oldest daughter. That was your Emily. oldest daughter? The, the one that was playing the trumpet, yeah. Yeah. My, and your daughter's playing the snare drum. Yeah, yeah. At the same elementary school. We used to see each other in the morning. In the in car line. line. The car line. Car line, <laughs> yeah. Which was early for us to be up. Oh, my goodness. Us, us guys that normally don't want to go to work before 10 and like, oh, I got to drive my daughter's. School. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> I lived in Bellevue at the time. Uh-huh. So this, the drive from Bellevue every day, yeah. you know, back and forth, you know. But, um, Yeah. My daughter didn't continue in her uh, percussion studies. Yeah, <laughs> but yours graduated to French horn. Mine, yeah, mine. Emily became a French horn player, and she got real good at it. But mm-hmm. then I had to buy a very expensive instrument. <laughs> I think drums are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, she she did pretty well with that for through high school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me, you got any more? Um, are you writing for anybody right now? Well, I mean, I just got done doing the whole, a whole choir record, and uh, so no, not right now. I'm kind of taking a little br- little break from it. Mm-hmm. I kind of write when I need to. Mm-hmm. Um, wrote with Derry for his record, and that was uh, very satisfying. And uh, but I don't know what's next. Uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, um, it's kind of like there's a time to sow and there's a time to harvest, and. So sowing, I guess, is when you create the stuff, and then harvesting is when you the record comes out, and and you get to talk about it, and then you get to go on tour and play the songs. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what we're, what's happening now. Mm-hmm. So you don't you, you don't write all the time. I mean, you don't no, you don't. don't keep a notebook and no, I don't. And write. Uh uh-uh, uh No. Write I'm, for for a need. So how yeah. do how do you come up with things to write about when you yeah. just need it for a certain project? Yeah, you know, I do gather ideas, you know, I do, like I call it, like, uh, shoot the bird while it's in your sight, you know, like, if an idea, because good ideas go by every day, somebody says something and you're like, oh, that's a song. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, in other words, if you, like, were out in the field, I'm not, I'm not a hunter, so I don't even know why I use this analogy, but if you're, like, you had a bird in your sight and you just go, there it goes, you know, if you don't pull the trigger, it's gone. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, pull the trigger, boom, you know, go get the bird and stick it in your bag or whatever don't you don't have to cook it up right there and then but you know uh sometime soon yeah <laughs> gather the idea write it down document it i tell i mean i'll on my iphone notes i'll make a little note so i yeah. but, so i collect ideas all the time mm-hmm. but i'm not going to flesh it all the way out uh for one reason i think that the best songs are the lyric serves the music so i don't usually finish a whole lyric and then try to put music on it as often as um gather an idea and then when the music comes and we figure out what the melody needs to be, then write the lyric to the music. It makes for a better song. Otherwise, yeah, you got yeah. too many words. You're trying to cram too many words. A lot of times, uh, the best chorus is like, come on this ride, the circle side. Come on this ride, ride, the circle side. You know, there's nothing to it. I wouldn't have wrote, there's the chorus, other than the melody needed to be da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da, you know? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So if you... Always written that way? No, there's no always. Uh, it, it, songs are written so many ways. Yeah. So I, I uh, so there's many exceptions. There's exceptions to to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, tend, I mean, just for you. Well, no, even me, I've written uh, all different ways. You know, I have written complete lyrics, and I have wait. I mean, I don't know, but for the most part, 
I feel the melody is the is the most important <coughs> thing. The melody is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And then the lyric needs to serve that. The lyric needs to serve the song, the way I approach it. Mm-hmm. So no matter what I write, I always completely readapt it to the song. You know, once we're we're playing together, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and craft. I feel like there's a craft. There's a, a poetry is a one thing, but song craftsmanship is a different kind of wordsmithing. You know, where you craft the song to uh, craft the lyric to the music. Okay. So I'm never precious about anything I write, you know. I could have a lot of things written, and then what I think is the third verse, all of a sudden, well, there appears the, the chorus, you know. Mm-hmm. So then you re, you re reapproach it. Okay. What yeah. was the, uh, when you did the uh, City on a Hill project, how, mm-hmm. how was that? Didn't, were there a, a lot of other writers involved? Well, I tried to um, to get the artist to, to have owner to be involved. All the people that I invited, I tried to really have them have ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew what I wanted to do um, with that whole series. And basically, yeah, I, I knew there was always structure. There was an, always an outline for me. And usually it was the, the father, son, spirit. Like God of Wonders, the first song, Old Testament. Then you have Precious Jesus, Son. And then you have Merciful Rain toward the end. I had this father, son, spirit flow on all the records, but mm-hmm. I didn't draw a hard line. Um, but it was very influenced by, we had done a record called At the Foot of the Cross before that, years before, and that was Clouds Rain Fire, which was father, son, spirit. Okay. And I had actually outlined it that way. But to me, that's the flow that always feels like a worship experience mm-hmm. to me. Mm-hmm. So... um I knew what kind of songs I wanted, but uh, then what I would invite, and I always would write some in advance, and wrote, I wrote quite a bit with Mark Bird and, and different people um, in advance of the, uh, there were four of those records. Um, but then I would really try to get the the artists that agreed to be on the record to, to ride and, and co-ride and write with us and bring, you know, so they would have ownership, mm-hmm. creative ownership, um, and have more heart in, in the project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you record all of it here? Yeah. All in Nashville, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I flew around. I, I, I flew to Atlanta to record third day and I flew to LA to record Fernando Ortega and, um, no, no. a few play mostly here, but I, 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 you know, we had to go to some, some people that like, you got to come to us. So, mm-hmm. okay. I recorded Mac Fowl in his hallway. <laughs> Um, really? I'm like, yeah, to win it because he was like not free, and I'm like, look, man, I gotta have you on this thing. And okay, so we we brought a little rig and set it up in his hallway, and he, you know, whatever we had to do, we we did. And where does he live? Yeah, uh, he was in Marietta, Georgia, okay. outside of Atlanta. All right. Yeah, good story about that one. Um, uh, we went out to Atlanta to on the first record. The second record is the one where I did him at his house, but the first one. Third Day wrote this song, uh, Mac wrote the title song, City on a Hill. You know, you are the light of the world. City on a hill cannot be hidden, you know, whatever. Um, so I went to Atlanta, me and Darian and Mark, to record Third Day at a pretty great studio. Really, really, I think it was called Southern Tracks. Pretty expensive, fancy, nice studio where they work because they're used to big budget, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we, we recorded that song, uh, City on uh, uh, you are the light of the world, city on a hill, whatever that the title song. But I wanted Mac to sing on God of Wonders, and I had recorded it months before. And and Cliff from Cayman's Call had sung it. But the idea of that whole album was community. That no one would sing their own harmony. That every song would have different artists. I wanted it to really reflect community. Okay. Even though there was never anybody there at the same time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought, man, I got to get Mac on this song. Um, and I. I, you know, so I, they were, were agreed to work all day, you know, 10 to six or whatever it was. So at five 30, I say to Mac, Hey Mac, I, I want you to sing on the band's gone and everything. Could you, would you be willing to sing on one other song? And he's like, well, I'm not supposed to, uh, my management is only, Oh, but he goes, well, you know, cause I go back a long way with, with Mac. He's going, ah, let me hear it. I go, you will just. You're not going to, I'm just going to, you're singing with along with other people. Lee Nash sang on it, you know, in the mm-hmm. intro and, and, and he's like, oh, okay, well, let me hear it. And he liked it. And, and he, he gave me a half an hour and he sang it. He sang it three times. And that was it. He went home at six. I had him from five thirty to six. Mm-hmm. And then we, he was so great on it, you know? Uh, and then 
Well, we it, they they owned it. I mean, it became their song. And in, in, in uh, at first, when it, the the management and all that was really mad about it because, like, wait really? a minute, if that's the single, if you're gonna the record company singles it, then our single's not gonna you know happen. Yeah. And it's not. And the band was mad because it wasn't their day. It was just Max singing on uh-huh. our production or whatever. <laughs> he was. Um, I mean, Mark and Christy Bird had sung it originally for the for the demo, but um. But then it ended up being such a huge song for them that it kind of broke them over the edge, and and uh, and uh, then they followed that. Was it that. that that same recording? Yeah, they just owned that, huh? They, they well, yeah. They, I mean, what I see is they they started playing it. I mean, okay. they they did this thing called offerings, their worship worship record that just went sold so much that it kind of mm-hmm. they went over the top after that. Mm-hmm. But the the song was definitely a catalyst for them, and they closed. They did it. For, for their encore for for years, I don't know if they still do or what, but it didn't hurt them any. Yeah. <laughs> but wow. it, sure, it didn't hurt me either. You know, it was, <laughs> it was uh, they were it was just great, and I I love those guys. Um, those guys in Third Day, you know, Mac and Mark Lee, they're just sweet guys, and you know, I owe Matt Mac a, a debt forever for for doing that because mm. it it uh, was the first thing I ever did that. Uh, had any kind of su- commercial success whatsoever. So hmm. <laughs> it was a That's pretty cool. f- fortunate deal. All what was around, that all experience like? I mean, um, <sighs> didn't you get a, you got Dove awards yeah, and got, all that I sort of stuff. Yeah, I got a few awards for it and, and stuff. But, um, well, I'll tell you, in some ways it was absolutely wonderful to succeed for finally, you know, in mm-hmm. my forties, you mm-hmm. know, I was 40 then, you know, and it's for, and, um, but it also was difficult because it changed uh, perception of me. And I was the guy that produced all the, the indie bands. You know, I produced, I love rock bands. The grunge, the bands that are like, they don't want the record guy to come down. They're like, they don't, you know, they, they're they like, the record company's the enemy. They're like rebels. And that's the guys I worked with, mm-hmm. you know. And it was all the, the misfits. And and, and uh, all through the 90s, I produced so many of those bands. Uh, but then when I became, when six, City on a Hill succeeded and all that, then I wasn't, no, no, bands weren't calling me to do that anymore. And then I'm expected to write uh, different kind of songs. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, it becomes, um, all about the money. Okay. Cause of course once you, you know, then, then it becomes industry. And then, yeah. you know, I've got their songwriter deal for 10 years. I wrote songs where I'd go into rooms with people and make my quota and write songs, songs, songs. And, and um, I never wrote that way, Aaron. I always wrote what I felt. You know, if I wrote a, a worship song, it's because I, I felt it. Yeah. And most of the time in the choir, there were songs are about relationships or, or they're just about whatever. I, and I, I remember going to writer rooms and, and uh, talk to guys and they'd be uh, wanting to, you know, whatever, get a song on, cut on Jackie Velasquez or whatever, whatever, you know, person. We need mm-hmm. to get a cut on this. And, um, They'd be all, what's your wait? I get to talk to them and find out their, their dog got put to sleep, you know, and they're bummed out. And I'm like, let's write a song about King, you know, King, your dog. Let's write about, you know, what's going on. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just want to write about what we feel. That's all. Yeah. You know, and so it got to where it, it becomes soul shriveling when you're trying to write songs for, with commercial, you know, with that mindset, I couldn't do it. Mm. So I had to quit it. You know, I quit it uh, years ago. I just can't couldn't be motivated by that. Um, How long did you do it before you came to I did to that 10 years. I had, a, I had a publishing thing for 10 years, yeah. Uh-huh. Where you have to make your 12 song quota and you know, it's a lot of songs when you're co-writing. Yeah. And um is that 12 songs a year? Yeah, that's typical. That's uh-huh. a typical uh writer deal that you know, toward the, a lot of us in town are like, "Hey, I'm at the end of my year, you know, I got to write two songs really fast and uh to make my quota, it's really typical." Um to keep your draw coming, you know. Yeah. But uh, no, I I got to where I didn't I, I didn't do that anymore, and I just um, I haven't written any worship type songs or anything for a long time. Mm. Um, I'm not saying I won't again, but um, but I, the choir has been wonderful in that way. Be- when we get to do a record, because to me it's this amazing outlet. It's an amazing outlet of expressing my soul and um. And uh, Derry sings it like Derry just owns it, you know. And this mm-hmm. last record, I think Derry's singing better he's ever, he's ever sung. Really, really wonderful. Uh, he's just this last record. It, I think is his best vocals. Uh, 
So, yeah, uh, I'm just, I mean, it sounds like I'm not thankful. I'm really, really thankful. I mean, I get to keep making music, and uh, I, I can't believe I get to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm surviving somehow, you know. It's hard to survive in this game. It is. It but is. Um, it's, I get to keep doing it I, with, with my brothers, you know, making music, and I get to say whatever I want, whatever I feel like, I'm just going to do it. And uh, I don't get into it like if I'll see a somebody will say, "I this one lyric that you wrote left me scratching my head. I don't know what you meant." Well, that's good that if I made you think. Yeah. What's so bad about that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't care if you think what I think or believe. I don't have any agenda to make anyone feel what think what I think or believe what I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, they got to work that out for themselves. So, you know, but I I don't I think it's if you make people think. Uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a great thing. That's that's what music is supposed to do, I think. Well, tell me, um, of all the years you've been in in the choir and um, all the things and experiences you guys have shared together, what's uh, probably the worst experience? <laughs> you know, I always say the glory fades and the humiliation lingers. You know, you remember the worst gigs. <laughs> you know, you forget about the Green Belt one with oh, all the wonderful festival gigs. Oh, we played right before Bruce Coburn or whatever. You know, what you remember is like, okay, in Florida, we're, we're, played, we're playing a gig where they have the wave pools and people are all in a raft, all in rafts and stuff. And they're floating around. And it, when, when the band plays, what they did when we, with this gig we had, they would stop the waves. So everyone had to sit there and float. And they'd mad, they'd boo, you know, the people would boo because the, the wave stopped because we're playing. And I remember some big fat kid lay in a raft right in front of us with giving, flipping us the bird with two hands the whole time we played. <laughs> you know what? Do you know the Slitter Bond? No. Okay. Mm-hmm. Matt from Sixpence worked at the Slitter Bond. And Matt's one of my best friends. I just yeah. played tennis with him last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, so uh, he worked at the Slitterbond. It's in Texas. Uh-huh. It's a wave pool thing, and uh, he did. I played there with Charlie Peacock. That, matter of fact, I think that's when I met Matt. Yeah. And um, so we're on top of this, on this stage that we just think it's a stage, you know, and there's it's water out there and it's still, and we're sound checking, uh-huh. and so we're not thinking. What's going to happen here? Because what happened, we would have never thought that that was going to happen. So we we go back on the on the bus, come back out to play the show, and we're playing, and in and people are standing out in their swim trunks, just standing in the water, water still <laughs> still, and all of a sudden this motor starts up, and we're on top of it. The stage is right over the motor, oh, and it no. starts producing waves. Oh, my. Which, what? Yes. While we're playing. And the people that were up close to the front of the stage when we first got there are now, like, way in the back because the waves just push everybody away from the stage. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we played our last song. Chuck was pissed off i mean we we all were and he he turned around at us and he said band meeting now in the bus <laughs> <laughs> oh man but i think it was i i think in the end for him it became a very humbling thing i yeah. think he got mad because his ego kind of got in the way you know, and then when he thought about it, he was he was like, you know, maybe I shouldn't complain. Well, I'm glad to hear you know? Charlie was humbled. Yeah. I was kidding. You know, he produced our, our record uh, way back in the 86, and uh, Charlie produced uh, Diamonds and Rain. He did? Yeah, and it was one of the first, I think we were the first band he produced outside of you guys' Exit Records world. Uh-huh. Okay. The reason being, you know, we were, you know, we're from L.A., you guys are from Sacramento, and we were big fans of your scene up there in the warehouse. You know, we didn't like our own peers, you know, because we, we were competitive with our own peers mm-hmm. in, in Southern California, all those bands. But we felt like we were misfits anyway. You know, we weren't, 
you know, we just felt misfits and, but we related to you guys, you know, to, especially the 77s. We were huge fans of the 77s and that record all fall down came out and we just loved that record and Charlie had produced it. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason that we wanted to get Charlie. You know, we didn't want anybody. They wanted us. We were, we wanted one of those. They're like, and Charlie was young, you know? Um, I don't know. I mean, but I, I don't think he'd produced anything other than, than you guys just seen up there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we really related to you guys' scene. We were big fans of, of, of cool. it. Cool. How did you, how did you like working with him? He didn't like working with me. I mean, <laughs> he didn't he didn't like the way I played, you know. So um, I was a little difficult. Well, he's used to working with guys like you, you know, and that was oh. it. Seriously, man. I mean, he's used to tighter guys. I was like my kick foot. He's like, you need to go work on your kick foot, Steve. <laughs> and he programmed a bunch of drum machine. I don't want to, you know. We were different. I mean, we were just learning how to be a band, and uh, oh no! I'm like, I what you know? Well, and then they had me playing this thing where I was triggering a, a pad. You know, I was triggering, and then I'm separate playing the snare separate, and the toms overdubbed, and so everything's separated like they oh, used yeah. to do in the '80s. You know, uh-huh. and I'm just like, let me just play. Let me just set up my kit and play. I says, I want the drums to sound like Creedence Clearwater. You know? Yeah. And the engineer's like, Creedence, that's horrible. Are you kidding me? Listen to Susie Q. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? That's the way drums are supposed to sound. Man. Who was the engineer? I'm not going to say. Did, I'm not out. I'm not did Charlie out. bring him along? No, we, he was our guy. Oh, know? he was but, your guy. Okay. But Charlie came down. But no, I mean, Charlie was, he was growing as a producer and, mm-hmm. you know, he's, and we didn't have our, our thing together. Our He had to write a bunch of songs with us and I don't know. I'm not going to say anything bad about Charlie's he's sweet. <laughs> you know, but we were finding our way. We, yeah. we were finding our way, and and and. Uh, but he definitely thought we were. We were. I mean, I felt like, yeah, he he's used to better guys. I, so I had a hard time with my my confidence. Hmm. Uh, yeah. But it helped me because I became a producer, and I I know that a drummer can't play if he doesn't feel good about himself. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I I instill a lot of confidence in drummers that I work with. Okay. You know, I make sure, and I will never. If I'm producing a band, I will never even hit a drum. I will never, and I'm not the drummer. You're the drummer. I dig right. your style, you know. Right. And I know, and uh, I mean, just as a producer in general, I think it's that line of creating an urgency and an excitement, and like this day will never come again. It matters so much. Mm-hmm. We're all passionate about music. Mm-hmm. It's really important. But by the other token, I mean, there's just not enough clean water in the world. I mean, there's bad things happen. There, there's things that are really bad, you know, that are really matter. And, and another, you know, 10 songs doesn't really matter that much. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So, um, perspective is per- good. Perspective. Yes. Perspective. It's like, it's really important. But, um, man, you're good. Let's have fun. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Because, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, it might not fly today. But 10 years from now, people will find out that all these people really loved it. Yeah. You know? Well, it's just like this. The, we're doing this prayer chain reunion, you know, uh, coming up in, in August. They're mm-hmm. playing. Uh, they did a big Kickstarter to do vinyl to do vinyl on the on the album that I produced. I produced their records. And the first one was Shawl. And, uh, you know, people care about it after 20 years, you know, it's a big deal. And, mm-hmm. and and Mercury, their other record, I, I had no idea at the time. It's just another band. I'm trying to help them, you know, somehow make a record somehow, you know, somehow get songs out of this mess. You know, yeah. I didn't know it was going to be uh, something that would, would, would be buoyant 20 years later. And mm-hmm. people cited it as their biggest influence and all this stuff. I mean, you, we don't know. You never know. Yeah. You never know. You just do the best you can yep. at that time, man, while, while you have the opportunity. That's right. Because you don't know what's come, coming down. And so you're doing that. You're doing one show in L.A. and you're doing a show here in Nashville. Yeah, the one in L.A. is uh, the Prayer Chain and Dakota Motor Company playing uh, in, at the House of Blues. I'm going to be there playing percussion with them. And they've got some events around, you know, that I'll be at. Mm-hmm. And then we come here to Nashville and it's... um. Dakota Motor Company, us and the Prayer Chain. Okay, we're kind of proud though because we're we're the old guys, but we're making we're the only ones making new records. You know, we've made <laughs> we we've never stopped making music. Right. So right. they're gonna play. You know, and it'll be great. But uh, we're gonna be like, hey, we just fin- our new record just came out. 
<laughs> so what have those guys been doing all this time? It's working jobs and stuff, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, almost nobody, you know, of all the bands I've produced and artists I've produced, I can count on about one hand, you know, how many are still in music. Um, it's so few people that survive and make it actually make a living in, in, mm-hmm. in, in music or the arts period. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, I, we're, we're some of the fortunate few. I think yeah. it's, it's, to me, it's a real blessing. To it do. is. Cause you guys have a lot Bunch. of bands down there in, in Southern California. Oh, uh, there's a lot a of lot. bands in Nashville. <laughs> huh? A lot of bands in Nashville. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. But just thinking oh, about but all the bands of, that were our peers back then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, there were there were a lot of bands, and uh, we're the ones that uh, kept going. it going, longevity. You know, yeah, I think it's because we somehow got along. It's mm-hmm. not like we always got along. You know, we've had plenty of conflict, like families do and brotherhood, but we we've survived because we've been merciful to each other and we've accepted one another. And um, I still like driving down the road with dairy mm-hmm. in a vehicle. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So that's pretty cool. Oh, man, that's great. Well, hey, I want to um, thank you for coming and being on the show today. Thanks, Aaron. You know, it's been great. It's I been was great a big fan you. of you since you were, you know, people know that you play with the Temptations, but they don't, might not know you play with the Romeo Void. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I forget that from time to time. <laughs> cool. Well, okay, man. Well, you have a good summer. Right. And uh, don't eat, don't eat the way that dairy eats. You know? <laughs> not going to happen. Yeah, you just watch out for no, it. No, 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 no. Not going to happen. Okay. See ya. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Brew. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.